Welcome to the Indie Nola First Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. Well, the book of Acts is, is uh, probably one of my all-time favorite books of the Bible. We're going to go into the book of Acts today. Um, not in a series, just in a one-time message, because there's a guy in there that the Lord has just really, uh, I guess, just reminded me of recently, and I, I've just been looking at his life and thinking about it and meditating on it, and I want to share some of the thoughts that I have with you on this particular guy. But in the book of Acts, um, you know, an Acts is aptly named as it's the Acts of the Apostles, and it gives the history of the beginnings of the church. And after Jesus had died and rose again and then ascended into heaven, his followers acted in a way that turned the world upside down and they truly changed their future history. What they did became the foundation of the church today. What they did became the foundation of the church today. You're sitting here today because of what they did. And you got to get a hold of that. And we can learn some serious lessons from this small handful of faithful followers. Think of this, okay? If just a small group of people way back then with no mass media, no printing press, very little education, no social media of any kind, no modern travel mechanisms, airplanes, cars, whatever, if they can change their world forever, what could we do with the tools we have? It's ironic to me that the, in today's world, we have more at our fingertips than any believers before us, yet the church as a whole seems to do less than it's ever done. We're introduced to one of these early champions of the faith in Acts chapter 6. And I just want to read verse 1 through 8, Acts chapter 6. So go there if you have a phone or if you have your Bible or whatever, and we're going we're gonna to read it together. And then we're going to kind of break this down a little bit. But starting with verse 6, but as the believers rapidly multiplied there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers, they had discontent in the church way back then. Isn't that awesome? That's not new. That, that's, that's something they had then and something we have now sometimes. But the Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of bread. Hey, they're getting bread and we're not... They're getting more bread than we are. They're getting better bread. We're getting the day-old, two-a-day-old stuff. They're getting the, the, the fresh stuff. I don't know what it was about, but it was, has to do with the, the daily distribution of bread and food. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. They said, <laughs> isn't it great the church has to call a meeting of all the believers to figure out this bread problem, right? So the 12 called the meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Amen? amen? You realize what you're saying when you say amen, right? You're saying you don't want your pastors running around running food programs when they should be praying and reading the word and getting ready to preach the word, right? Doing the work of the ministry, the hands-on work of the ministry falls to the people, not necessarily to the leadership of the church, even though they organize it. Verse 3, and so, brothers, I'm just finding some stuff in here for you. To, I mean, this isn't my message. I just love, love reading the Bible, and you find this stuff, and you're like, well, that's cool. And so, brothers... They said, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Verse 5, everyone liked this idea. And they chose the following. Stephen, parentheses, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convict, convict, convert to the Jewish faith. He might have been a convict, I don't know. And verse 6, these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them, so God's message continued to spread. The, the number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. I think that's amazing. The religious priests of the Jewish tradition... They were even converted. And verse 8, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. All through, uh, although there are seven men listed here, it's not hard to see that Stephen is the focus. 
In fact, as you continue on through chapter 7, the focus is definitely on Stephen. This is a guy who became the very first person to die for the Christian faith. He was the first martyr for Christ, the very first one. And I want you to think about that just a second. He was the man that God ordained to be the first to spill his blood for the message of the gospel. I mean, Jesus died starting the new covenant, right? We know he died. He spilt his blood, obviously. But this is the first man, 100% man, the first guy who laid down his life for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was deemed worthy enough to be known for all eternity as the first person to die for the cause. And I think that's extremely significant. We kind of read over that. Oh, yeah, Stephen was the first, mur- first martyr. He was the first one murdered for the faith. Yeah, we know that, right? It's, just, it's, it's like, it's, like it's, it's Bible trivia to us, and we don't sometimes think about the ramifications of that. No one had ever done that before. No one had ever laid down their life for this message before this day that we're reading about right here. And you know that started something. This is truly a man worth looking at, a believer worth studying, a Christ follower worth emulating. And in the the verses I just read to you, there are at least five characteristics listed within this man that made him the leader that he was. He is a pattern that you can act upon, an example worth repeating. So number one, he was a believer of good report. The New Living Translation says this, Acts chapter 6, first part of verse 3, says, And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected. Well-respected. Other translations say it differently. Of good reputation. Of honest report. I think the Amplified says good reputations. Men of good reputations. Men of godly character and moral integrity. That's what we're talking about, a believer of good report. And understand that these are all accurate translations, even though they're a little different. The Greek word here takes us deeper into the truth of this verse. These seven men whom Stephen was picked first had to be men that wouldn't wreck their witness. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't wreck your witness. They had to have good reputations. They had to be men of godly character and moral integrity. And if you're a board member, one of our our elders in the church, on the board of elders, this this should speak volumes to you. If you are a leader in the church of any kind, this should speak volumes to you. And if you're not, there's other verses that say you should want to be a leader, and so you should take this very seriously. This is for everybody this morning. They had to have good reputations. They had to be men of godly character and moral integrity. Men of honest report means that they should be men who would be authentic witnesses of Christ. People of good report. Men of good report. This is a pattern for us all here today. Stephen was a man of good report. He was a believer. He was full of integrity and holding up his witness for Christ. That that, that foundational thing that held it up his witness was this on authenticity of belief that he had. He was honestly a true witness for Christ. That's what an honest report means. He was honestly an authentic witness for Christ. He was truly a witness for Christ, a person with a good reputation in and outside the church. And have you ever noticed that how there's a tendency for people to exalt competency over character? Not in every situation, but but so often, talent, ability, education seem to trump character. Am I I talking to anybody today? Have you ever seen that? I'll give you an example. In in another church I was at many years ago, there, there was an individual who was very gifted in business. He was smart with money, and he was savvy as an investor. He had strong opinions about the church and how it should be run. He was chosen to be on the governing board of the church because of these attributes. But he wasn't a man of high character, and he should not have been on the board. He fell short in the area of good report. He wasn't known as an honest or authentic witness of Christ. He was gifted. He was talented. He was super smart. But he lacked character. An impressive resume of worldly success and higher education 
will never outweigh the character of an individual when it comes to true success. It's not wrong to be talented, okay? It's not wrong to, to grow your business and be successful. It's, it's not a bad thing to be excellent with your money. And it's certainly not wrong to strive in your educational pursuits. But without character, all those things will only bring you temporary fulfillment and temporary success. Character counts. It matters. It matters, church. Stephen was a man of character, of good report, of honest witness, and he was truly respected. What a pattern for us to act on, to be a person of good report. And if you're doing a little personal inventory right now, that's okay. I'm not here to condemn anybody today. I'm not here to point fingers. I, if you ever point fingers at someone, realize you got three pointing back at you, right? That's not the point. But it's good to take a little inventory and go, okay, am I a person of good report? What do I need to do different? What do I need to adjust? What do I need to change? A believer full of this Holy Spirit. That's number two. Acts 6, verse 3 again, but the next part of verse 3 says, you know, it says, select seven men who are well-respected, of good report, and are full of the Spirit. Full of the Spirit. I, I want you to think about that for a minute. Full of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. What an awesome thing to say about somebody. That person's full of the Holy Spirit. For, for a container to fall under the definition of being full, one would logically assume that there is no room within the container for anything else, right? It's full of whatever it's full of. So there is no room for anything else. So if a glass is full, there's no more room within it to put anything else. And if we are the container here, and we are full of the Holy Spirit, there's no room for anything else. Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, not full of himself, not full of personal concerns about work or career or even family. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He operated as one who had died to self and was living for Christ. And understand that when you empty yourself of self and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and fill up the space, he will use you like you've never been used before. Truly, there will be a river of, of, of life flowing out of you to all those around. And let me explain that. God will fill you with himself, his precious Holy Spirit, and then will pour you out like a drink offering on a dry and thirsty land. And when he pours you out, he simultaneously will be filling you back up with his Holy Spirit and will be like that flowing river that never runs dry. It's like, fill me up, God. Oh, I'm full. <laughs> now I can just sit here and be full doesn't work that way, does it? In fact, the Word of God says, be being full, be being filled, and not just filled once. We are to be in a constant state of being filled so that we can always be full of the Holy Spirit. He's pouring us out, and we're allowing him to do that, and he's filling us up, and he's pouring us out, and he's filling us up, and pretty soon it's just a river flowing out. Stephen displayed this pattern for us. We should act upon it and strive to be full of the Spirit. But this is something that is not just done for you. It's not just done for you. It's something that you have to fight for a little bit. You can't be full of the Spirit without sacrifice. There are many things that try to fight for the space within the container of our heart. Right? Worldly pleasures, material things, emotional hurt and pain, hatred and anger, how can you be full of the Holy Spirit if you're full of anger or full of unforgiveness or full of worldly passions or desires? Here's the answer. You can't until you empty yourself of that stuff and receive the Lord Jesus into your heart and let him just fill you up with his love and who he is and it just overtakes you. That's how you become that new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Jesus, help us be like Stephen. Stephen. Help us to follow his pattern of being full of the Holy Spirit. Help us to be alive to you and dead to ourselves, Lord. He was a man of good report. He was a, a, a believer full of the Spirit. He was, number three, a believer full of wisdom. He was full of wisdom. 
The next part of that same verse, there's three attributes in this verse, uh, or verse three, chapter six. 3C says, and wisdom. His good report is full of the spirit and wisdom. This word wisdom here is the Greek word Sophia. And it, it really is an all-encompassing kind of wisdom or wisdom in the broad sense. It literally means all wisdom, worldly and spiritual. Wisdom that is acquired through experience and wisdom that is bestowed on you by God. It's all of it, all right? This would simply, or, or this would imply that we need to seek godly wisdom through his word, godly counsel, and even listening prayer. That's the kind of prayer that listens as much as it talks. You know, we talk a lot when we pray, don't we? Pull out our list. Here's my list, Jesus. Now you got to answer me. Are you just quiet today or are you listening this morning? <laughs> Seems like you're kind of quiet today. Maybe we should just sit and listen and let him speak to our hearts. Oh, I've never heard God speak to me ever. Maybe it's because you never listened. Just sit there quietly and listen in silence. This also holds true when it comes to wisdom in the worldly sense. Wisdom defined is simply the ability to apply acquired knowledge. So all true wisdom comes from your ability to listen, to truly hear and learn, whether it's from God or, or things of this world. You're not going to gain wisdom in the classroom by not listening. You have to listen, right? Dr. Litchie spoke last week, and I had the privilege of going on a, a retreat um, for the presbyters, and that, the, that he, he was the speaker at, the leader of it, and it was Sunday night and Monday of last week, and it was great. And one of the things that he said to me was that uh, if people refuse to listen, they will end up having to feel. I, I want you, to, I want to explain that in a minute. Listening, truly listening, will result in wisdom, and wisdom will help you avoid some not all, but some of life's circumstances. How many know if you're full of wisdom, you can avoid some bad things? Yes. All right? Well, if you refuse to listen and you don't gain that wisdom, you're not going to be able to avoid those bad things. And those circumstances, some of those in particular, will force you to feel and they'll force you to feel pain. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a weirdo that likes pain. Some of you are like, oh, I don't mind pain. I'm tough. I can handle it. I don't like pain. I don't want to feel it. So if I can listen and gain some wisdom so I can avoid some of the pain, I'm all about it. I don't want to feel that pain. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Learning from others through great books, podcasts, that's helpful. Listening to good preaching, being intentional about growing in wisdom. Let me ask this question. Are you a sponge when it comes to learning and growing in wisdom? Are you intentional with your time in reference to putting yourself in a position to learn? There's a part of us that just, you know, and, and I have this too. I, I love to be entertained. Just to sit and, and do nothing and let myself be entertained. I don't have to work. I don't put, I put any effort into anything. Just sit and do nothing and be entertained. And although there may be a place for that in our lives... There's hopefully another part of us that desires wisdom. I don't specifically know where those lines are for you. I'm not saying I do. But it's a wonderful thing to do a little inventory of our time spent simply being entertained versus our time being intentional about gaining wisdom. Stephen was a man of wisdom, or he wouldn't have been chosen. They were looking for seven who displayed these attributes, one of those being wisdom. And when we see in verse 5, and then we see in verse 5 of our text this morning, and they chose the following, Stephen. They started with him. The others are listed as well, but Stephen was first. He was listed first. He must have been the easy pick. You know, you ever ask yourself those weird questions when you read the Bible? Why, why was he listed first? Why was this guy not listed? He was listed first. He was full of wisdom. He must have been the no-brainer choice. And what a great thing for us to pattern from his life, wisdom, to be intentional about, about gaining wisdom. So this guy, Stephen, who was the first martyr, and we, we know that because we're so good at Bible uh, trivia, right? He was a man of good report. He was full of the, of the Spirit, and he was full of wisdom. And four, he was full of faith. 
Verse 3 tells us that they were looking for individuals who were of good report, men who were filled with the Holy Spirit, believers who had obtained wisdom, both spiritually and worldly matters, and these men would take care of the day-to-day tasks, specifically the distribution of food to the widows, leaving the apostles more time to pray and teach the Word of God. Acts chapter 6, verse 5 says, Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to just camp out here for just a second. I I know I'm not getting to the faith part yet, but I will. Nothing that is written in the Bible is filler or fluff. There's no fluff there, right? There's no filler. There's no, well, let's just throw this in for good measure. It's all purposely put in there. And it lists the seven men chosen, all of which obviously met the criteria. But again, Stephen was listed first, and then in those parentheses, it states he was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't do this for the others listed. In fact, the others are never mentioned again. Presumably, they were all full of faith in the Holy Spirit, but why does it restate it or state it specifically for Stephen again? I think he was, he was the most excellent example of the kind of man they were looking for. He was the whole package, so to speak, the real deal, through and through. This guy was full, and we've already talked about what that word means a little bit, but he was full of faith. According to Hebrews, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right. He had this hope, this absolute belief in Jesus as the true Messiah. He had no doubts, and his life apparently reflected the trueness of his faith. What causes someone to step out of the boat and walk on water as Peter did? Faith. The kind of faith that is marked by the absence of doubt. What causes or prompts us to pray as a people? I'm telling you, it's faith. When you have no doubts in who our God is and what he's about, prayer flows naturally from you. You pray because you have no doubt that he's going to hear you, right? How can an individual give 10% of their increase, 10% of their money? How can they tithe to their church and to the work of the Lord? Faith and faith alone, people. How can you put yourself out there and lay hands on a, on a family member who is sick or a coworker who needs physical healing or even a complete stranger who comes into your life as a divine appointment for you to minister to? It's faith. Faith does all those things. I don't believe you would step out if you didn't have faith. When you are full of faith, when you know that you know that God is who he, who, who he says he is and he'll do what he says he'll do, that's when you will be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. Stephen was full of faith. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith in Jesus Christ is the very foundation from which all ministry flows. You can't truly serve others, you can't love others, you can't counsel you or or pray for or or really encourage others without faith in Christ. You really can't do it because it all flows from your faith in Jesus Christ. And do you realize that faith is the opposite of fear? And when faith rises up and overwhelms our fear, fear doesn't get a foothold. You see, fear paralyzes but faith moves mountains. Fear puts you in chains. Faith gives you freedom. Fear cripples. Faith heals. Both fear and faith believe that something is going to happen that has not happened yet. But where faith believes that something bad is going to happen, faith believes that something awesome is about to take place. Fear puts the responsibility of the outcome on the devil's shoulders. Faith rests assured that the outcome is in the hands of Jesus. Wow, to pattern our our lives after Stephen's example, to truly act on that pattern of faith, it's it's not a bad idea, church. It's a great idea. So we know that he was a man of good report. We know he was full of the Spirit. We know he was full of wisdom. And we know he was full of faith. And number five is... He was a believer full of power. Acts 6, 6 through 7. These seven were presented to the apostles. 
who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. These seven were chosen, and they were prayed for, and the message of the gospel spread. Praise God. Not only did the message spread, but people believed, and and the church grew. In fact, it exploded in numbers. Even the religious priests and the faith and the Jewish faith of the Jewish faith were being converted. Not just not just a few, but many. And then verse 8 puts the attention back on Stephen again. Must have been something else, this guy. Stephen. This is in 6 8, first part, A. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. It says that he was full of grace in this translation, and that word grace is translated from the same word as the word faith that we just talked about. So I'm not going to do that one again. But then it says power. Power. Stephen was full of power. The original Greek word here is the word dunamis. Everybody say dunamis. dunamis. Say, I speak Greek. I speak Greek. Dunamis. <laughs> it's Greek for power. And it means strength, power, or ability. It's the inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature, or which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. Stephen was full of power, the kind of power that is sourced in God alone. It was God's power that was living on the inside of Stephen. Acts 6, 8, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, says, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. Based on the God power that was within him, he, per- he performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. His entourage were signs and wonders. We had a series about that one time. Signs and wonders followed him because he was a believer, a real, true, authentic believer, full of power. It's not hard to imagine that this, is, this was exactly what Jesus was describing when he said, signs and wonders would follow those that believe. It's no wonder that God chose Stephen to be the first martyr for Christ. He was a great example of the kind of life every believer should pattern. And, and I, don't, I don't look at, at his life and then look at mine and go, oh, he had signs and wonders. Where are my signs and wonders? I guess God doesn't love me. I don't, look at, I don't look at it and compare it that way, but I do say, that is something to shoot for, right? That's something to go after and believe in and looking at these attributes of his life and applying them to my life and saying, I, man, I, I want to walk like this guy walked. I want to be like this guy was. I've often read through Acts and I moved right through chapter 6 and 7 and haven't thought about the impact that this one man had on the world. And yes, he was of good report and he was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom and he was full of faith and power. We've talked about all that. And he died for his faith. And I just got to thinking with all of these amazing attributes that he displayed in his life, how can his story end with just dying for his faith? It seems kind of like, it kind of digresses there, right? Here he is, this great guy with all these attributes, and now he's dead because of them. I mean, it seems to me that there should be some kind of vindication here. And remember, he didn't just die, he was drugged out of the city and stoned to death. He was the first pick to be one of the seven, and his story ends with people throwing rocks at him until one finally killed him. It just seems like having all these wonderful qualities that qualified him, it was really just a curse. And I, I, I tried to picture stoning, and we, we see that happen in the Bible lots of times. That was a way people, you know, pronounce judgment on somebody, and they stone them to death. I, and, and I don't know why I think this, but I, I, I've often just kind of glossed over that and said, oh, that's terrible, he, he, a rock hit him in the head and he died. But can you imagine the time it took to kill a person when a crowd of people was just throwing rocks at them? I mean, one would hit you in the arm, one would hit in your leg. It might break, maybe a big one they threw at your foot and it broke your ankle. I mean, all those little breaks and bruises and, and cuts and, and, and uh, uh, the bleeding that took place, and you're just hoping that one, I mean, you can't get up. You're, you're just basically beat to a pulp with rocks. And even the people throwing them, think about that. They're, they're throwing a rock, 
and they're seeing the blood, they're seeing the anguish of this individual, and what do they do? They pick up another one and throw it again. It, it, it's just such a brutal thing when you try to picture it in your mind. And, and I imagine if you were Stephen, you're just hoping that, man, I just wish one would nail me in the noggin and get this thing over with, right? It was brutal. This is what he gets for displaying these attributes. And I think, why is that, God? It just seems so not right. But at the end of chapter 7, as Stephen was being stoned to death, he uttered some powerful words that ended up being his last words. Acts 7, 59 through 60. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't he? Father, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These were words that a young man, and I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. I want you to take those five points of Stephen. I just want to switch gears here a little bit. Because I, I want you to understand that Stephen's life was not, his, his death was not in vain. These were words that a young man named Saul heard. As people laid their coats at his feet, he apparently was giving approval to all that was happening right in front of him. He too had heard Stephen's speech that was 58 verses long just prior to his murder in chapter 7. And after the killing of Stephen, Saul went on a rampage. Now, I, I, I'm using my imagination here a little bit, but here's Saul. He's trying to put a stop to this thing called the way, right? He's trying to get this movement to stop. He's a religious leader. He's a Pharisee himself. He, was, he studied under a great teacher. He was known to be smart. He was known to be a religious guy. And he was there to put a stop to this. And he's going, all right, this Stephen's going down. They were giving him his coats, and he was nodding his head. That's how I picture it. And, and he was giving approval to what was happening to Stephen. And when he heard those words, do you think that, that those words would not have shook him to the very core? And then I think his reaction to that is, well, I might have been wrong, but I'm going to prove that I was right. And so he goes on this rampage of killing Christians. Look, look at uh, uh, Acts 8, 1 through 3. Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. And I guess what I'm saying is I, I, I feel like there was a little guilt deep down inside Saul because he knew what Stephen had said. So he just goes on a rampage to prove his point. In Acts chapter 9, 1 through 3, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in change. Stephen's death was not futile. His life as a reputable man, a man full of Holy Spirit, a man full of wisdom and faith and power to perform miracles, it wasn't, it, it was, it wasn't for naught. All of it had a profound effect on this young Jewish, Jewish religious leader named Saul. And I think the witness of Stephen rocked Saul's world. And we know this because in chapter 9, Saul is confronted while on the road to Damascus. He's confronted by heavenly light so bright that he fell to the ground, and then Jesus speaks to him audibly. Saul was forever changed that day because of, of that day. Because of that day, his name was even changed to Paul. But I would venture to say that it was all the witness of Stephen's life and death that got his heart churning. He saw this happen. It was going on in his heart. 
He's still fighting against it, killing Christians. He's going to do it his way. And then Jesus says, wait a minute. And then it all just breaks down. Were Stephen's efforts to live right and serve right and even die right, were, there, were, were they futile? Maybe the best answer to that question is another question. Would we have a Paul if we wouldn't have had a Stephen? Stephen didn't die in vain. I believe Paul's salvation was a direct result of Stephen's witness. Yes, God met him on the road, but something was going on in his heart before that. And you know that Paul wrote more of the New Testament than any other author, and that he was the apostle who carried the gospel into modern-day Europe. He's why we're here today in his missional journeys. You don't know who's watching. You don't know who will come to Christ because of how you live your life. Stephen lived a life. He gave us a pattern worth acting on. He was an amazing example of how we should live our lives, even if that means martyrdom for the cause of Christ. How you live your life may raise up a leader, like a Paul, who changes the world. Yeah, Stephen's life was taken too quickly. I believe that. I I believe it's sad, because what more could have he done? You say, God, what were you doing? But let me tell you something. The blood of the saints always waters the church. It always does. When people see that someone's willing to lay down their life for the cause of Christ, it shakes them. It rocks them to the core. And church, why is this message important to us here and now? Because I believe as, as we get closer to the end of this dispensation of grace, this time when grace is is running and and flowing free and every person has a chance to repent and turn to Christ. Every person has a chance to, to choose him in this time. But when that time changes, it it's over for people who have not chosen him. You understand the the ramifications of that. And as we get Closer and closer to when that time changes. I mean, you can feel it, right? You can feel the signs of the times. We can recognize them. We don't know the day and the hour. We're not going to predict anything, any, 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 any dates or anything like that. that. That's not what we're supposed to do. But when we start seeing the signs of the times, it's a cue for us to get busy about the Father's work and to live like we've never lived before. And guys like Stephen are great examples Let's pray. First of all, God, I, I, I thank you for your word. I thank you for making sure that we had the story of Stephen in the book of Acts. And Lord, I pray his life would just challenge us today to be everything we could be, no, no, no matter what that means, no matter if that even means death for your name. Lord, if there's a person in here who's never accepted you and they just want to know more about this this thing called Christianity and this this experience called being born again and and their their heart is just like being drawn to you right now, Lord, I I just pray that you you would overwhelm them with your Holy Spirit. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you want to do that, that's the beginning. That's just saying, Lord, I I love you. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. I I need to to, to repent of my sins and walk away from that life and and live for you. That's really all you're saying when you receive Jesus as your Savior. Is there anyone like that here today that said, yeah, I need to receive him as my Lord and Savior? I've never done that before. Is anybody like that? Everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. So we pretty much have a room full of people who have Jesus as their Savior. It's awesome. But then there's this call or this this challenge, I guess, today 
when you look at a guy like Steve and say, you know, am, am, am I following a pa- the pattern of his life? Am, am, I, am I looking at what he did? And can I, is there some things about his life that I can emulate? This guy was true to the end. And if you're here today and it's like, yeah, I need to do a little better in this area. I need to, I need to get a little more eternally focused. Not let the things of this world just uh, take over my life. And those things need to become strangely dim. If that's you today, I want you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, I love you so much. And I give you my heart today once again. I ask you to to not just be my Savior, but to be my Lord over all. I say yes to you today. I say yes to your will. I say yes to your ways. I say yes to the divine appointments you have for me. God, let my life make a difference to others. Let me be a light in a dark place. Let me live and go for, live for you and go for broke on this thing called Christianity. I want to spread your love. I want to spread your your goodness and your kindness and your joy and your peace and the happiness that comes only when we find you. Help me to do that to the best of my ability, God. Change me from the inside out. Conform me to your image, oh God. I just want to be Jesus with skin on. And Lord, I'll praise you. I'll praise you in advance for all the good things you're going to do through me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.